We will now move on to the Legislative District 11 House race, of which we have two of the four candidates, I believe, here today. We have Hollis Lyon, and we have Brett, Brett Roberts. So, So we want to thank them for being here today, and this is going to go just like the Senate forum did. So you'll have 30 seconds to introduce yourself, then we'll take questions either from me or the audience, and then you'll have 60 seconds at the end to uh, complete uh, your thoughts okay. and convince folks to vote for you. So we'll start with, um, you have microphones there that they've left for you. We'll start with Hollis, if you want to introduce yourself to the audience, and then um, we'll get going. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I'm Hollis Lyon. I uh, taught school for a year in public school, uh, public school math, and then I went into the Air Force. I was uh, in communications and computer systems. I served in the Pentagon. I served in NATO headquarters. And then uh, I stayed in, in Northern Virginia and went into a couple of private businesses for a while. And, uh, and now I'm here. I have been uh, five, 10 years ago, actually, I moved here to take care of my mother. So uh, I have enjoyed Arizona. My folks have been here for a long time, and I'm glad to be running. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. My name is Brett Roberts. I am currently the constable here in Maricopa, um, so I am currently elected. And I am running because I believe that Arizona is currently on track as far as um, economic growth and development. I believe that we're doing things right here in the state of Arizona, and I think we need to continue on that path to uh, grow the economy, keep people in um, businesses moving here to the state of Arizona so we can continue to increase revenue. Again, my name is uh, Brett Roberts, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. doesn't look like we're going to start off with any questions from the audience. So I am going to ask a question I didn't ask in the previous forum because we got to keep it exciting in here. And at the end of the last forum, they brought up uh, Prop 127, which is going to be on the ballot. So let's start with, you know, what's your energy policy if you support Prop 127 um, in the 50% renewables um, by 2030? Hollis? Well, uh, I have to tell you, this was a tough question for me. Uh, I totally think we ought to move to renewable energy, and we need to do that as quickly as we can because we should have been doing that since the 70s, but obviously we hadn't been. Uh, the thing I don't like about 127 is that it is going to put it into the Constitution of the state of Arizona that we have to get to a certain point by a certain year. That means that regardless of whether it's you know, going to hurt a whole lot or not, we would have to get there. And that's not, that's not good. I don't like that part of it. But what I came down to was this. I think we ought to uh, support 127 in the final. And the reason is because without actually pushing uh, our systems and research and development, our uh, power, our electric companies, et cetera, to go into renewable, we have tended to kind of fall back and be complacent and relying on fossil fuels. And APS, for instance, makes $400 million a year in profit. Why can't we pour some of that back into uh, more and more renewables? The CEO of APS makes $15 million a year in salary. $15 million a year. And, oh, by the way, they are a regulated utility. So I think what we need to do is we need to pass 127. We need to uh, do everything we can as a state to get behind renewable energy. And we need to elect new people to the Arizona Corporation Commission that are going to be very careful, uh, that's right, about how much of that is passed to us. Because the cost of doing that does not have to be passed to the consumer. It could be, a lot of it at least, could be absorbed by the companies, the utilities that are regulated. Thank you, Hollis. Mr. Roberts? So I think you guys are going to see quite a bit of contrast on most of the stuff up here today. But um, as far as 127, 
Um, first and foremost, uh, I will say that I coincide with what she had to say as far as I don't think we need to be uh, choosing or creating this type of policy at the ballot box for a simple reason of that once this gets passed, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to change. But there's many other reasons why I don't support this. One is, uh, for the most part, it's going to increase your cost by about $1,000 a year. Number two, countries outside of the United States are pulling away from renewables. So right now, Canada, China, uh, yeah, this is accurate information, and it's verifiable. If you want, I can give you the article where you can see it, because Canada, China, um, and uh, Japan, um, there are, and there's another one that I can't think of at the moment that is actually pulling away and, and diverting funds back towards coal and, and natural gas. So this is information that I would be happy to give you um, that is accurate information. They are pulling away from it. And the uh, solar industry is kind of becoming a fossil as far as the industry is concerned. So this is accurate information. I'll be happy to post the article on my Facebook page so you guys can see it. So can I say something back? Yes, actually, I'm sorry. I was incorrect in the earlier forum, and we are allowing rebuttals as long as we are staying on topic, okay. specific to the question, which was Prop 127 and the 50% renewable mandate. Okay, great. Well, uh, I, think, I think Mr. Roberts is right. If we don't change the people on the Corporation Commission, our energy taxes are going to go skyrocketing. And that's why we need to change the people on the Corporation Commission, because there is no other reason to do that. And one other thing. As far as other countries pulling out, I don't know if that's true or not, but guess what? I like that idea. Because if other countries pull out, that is a fabulous opportunity for us to jump in and fill that void. And now is the time to do it. Let's get in there and let's do it right now. Thank you for that. <laughs> Looks like we have no questions from the audience. So you have to submit. Yeah, you have to come. So I'll follow up on this question, then maybe she'll be ready for her question. So we've talked about 127 and the constitutional issues and the potential for increases in costs. I'm president of our local governing board, so increased energy costs are obviously a concern to me. Mm -hmm. what, what is your plan to help provide the funding to the schools if 127 passes and, and our energy costs are increased? Yes, he starts this yeah, time. Thank you. Yes. Well, as far as increasing funding to schools, um, one thing that I think needs to be pointed out is on the Republican side in the last four years, uh, that, and this is, again, verifiable information, you can go and look up and see who has voted to increase funding for schools. Predominantly, almost unanimously, the Republican side are the only ones that have voted to increase funds for schools. And the argument as far as why they choose not to on the on the left side is that it's not enough and it's not guaranteed and we can debate about whether or not things in life are guaranteed because most things are not but as far as creating income for education the one of the, the, the main things that need to be done is creating a business friendly environment in the state of Arizona so we continue to have businesses move here people move here because they're bringing in revenue and they're bringing in, that's one of the only ways that you can increase the pie as far as the tax revenue pie. So you either are one gonna increase jobs and economy and people wanting to live in the state of Arizona who come here and pay taxes. Um, the other way that is, is to reach into your pocket and increase taxes. And that's not something I'm in favor of doing. However, there is another way that is, um, that you can increase the pie, and, and this is something that uh, we talk about um, on the LD11 team, is that, you know, the state of Arizona, if you look at it, we have about 16 to 17 percent of the land as far as our tax base is concerned. If you compare that to a state like New Jersey, where they have 97 percent of their land, that's a huge difference. We're at a deficit to even start before the budget is even drawn on, drawn up, we're at a deficit to start with and compared to eastern states. And this is a, a huge problem in western states because you can, you can look this up. As Senator Mike Lee out of Utah is uh, working on this particular issue. Um, we need to get those lands because if you were to just 
If, if we had those lands and we started collecting the fees that are, that are raised on those lands, and I'm not talking about selling the lands, I'm talking about just in itself the fees that are raised on those lands that are sent to the federal government and not to the state of Arizona. A, a very um, conservative number would be roughly half a billion dollars that would be coming to the state could, that could then be diverted to education. Thank you. Hollis? Well, there are several ways to answer this question. Number one, uh, we could always exempt schools from their t from the new tax if we actually ended up doing that. Uh, I kind of reject the premise because, as I said, if we change the Corporation Commission, uh, the rates won't go up that much, and so we would be able to uh, to keep those those rates back down, and the taxes wouldn't go up. So, yeah, so the rates and the rates wouldn't go up. So uh, I I kind of fight that whole premise, but. Um, there are lots of different ways we can bring in more money into the state revenue coffers without raising taxes on individuals. And uh, one of them is, uh, as we like to say in this LD11 team, we can eliminate uh, some of the $13.7 billion a year in tax loopholes. And our, yeah, our entire state budget is only $10 billion a year. Now, uh, can we eliminate 13.7 billion? Heavens no, we can't do that. But if we were to put together a nonpartisan commission and take a look at that, out of the accumulating 13.7 billion that's been accumulating since the 1990s and hasn't been cut, it's just been added to, then we need to be able to probably get one or two billion out of that, one and a half billion, I'm not sure, but there are over 330 tax loopholes that we need to take a look at and see if we're getting a return on investment. Now, let me, let me talk about taking over the federal lands. Uh, gee, what could go wrong if the state takes over the federal lands? Uh, let, me just, let me just talk to a, two points of that. Number one, if you want to buy a house and rent it out, and you suddenly want to become a landlord or a landlady, because you think it's going to bring in a lot of rent and, and increase your income. That's a wonderful idea. But what happens if you first have to put $30,000 into just fixing the house up? And what happens if after that happens, the, the uh, air conditioning system goes out and you have to pay $15,000 for another air conditioning system? And what if, and what if, and what if? If we take over those federal lands, we are now responsible for it. Do you know that the Wallow Fire cost $109 million. One fire, one fire cost the federal government $109 million. The Arizona budgets, Arizona state budgets five to $10 million a year for fire, uh, for, you know, fire suppression and firefighting. One good fire and we would just wipe out the Arizona budget. It would be horrendous. So you're taking on a huge liability by taking on federal lands. Thank you. I think Mr. Roberts wanted to make a couple comments before we move I'm on. I'm trying to remember all the points that I wanted to talk <laughs> about uh, in reference to what Ms. Lyon was just saying. As far as the fire, the fire um, example, I'm glad she brought up fire because earlier you guys heard about um, Mr. Atchew talked about us talking about thinning forests. Uh, thinning forests in the northern Arizona actually will help twofold. It will help with fires, and that's something that needs to be taken a look at. The other thing is... Um, when it comes to thinning forests in northern Arizona, y you have acres of land up there that at one point in time had 100 trees per acre. Now they have 1,000 trees per acre. So Mr. Atchew's point where nature is taking care of the tree issue is not accurate. We have more trees now than we ever did. If you have an 18-inch ponderosa pine, it sucks up 180 gallons of water a day. So that's going to help with water as well. As, and then thinning forests, you have forests that survive from a fire if you thin the forest versus the entire forest being destroyed. Um, one of the, back to the original question, as far as um, creating a, you know, a plan for money for schools. Are you guys aware that in the state of Arizona, and this is something that I think Holly and I actually agree upon from a certain point, is that Arizona has 225 school districts. That's 225, and our neighbors to the north Nevada have 17. So that's something that I think we need to look at as far as why do we have, why do we need so many school districts in the state of Arizona? Now that's not going to be an easy sell, I guarantee you, because those are governing bodies and they're just like cities and towns and counties. 
Um, so they would have to agree to do this if they were going to combine in, in, on you know, different school districts. So those are just a couple of points I wanted to make. I lost my train of thought on some of the others, but there were so many things I, want, I didn't have a pen and paper to write them down, so thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay. And I, I think when you, when you noticed it was tax, she was discussing tax loopholes, so that may have been what you wanted to rebut on. But she's going to go. I think we have a question from the audience. Okay. And so okay. I That's would right. love I to give them the opportunity since we've had very few. This question is from Vernita Alexander. Alexander. And this should be our last question. Last question. Oh, wow. Already. That's quick. Wow. <laughs> Okay, I came here because I did not understand Prop 127, whether to vote for it or not to vote for it. But just hearing the little tidbits from you too, I still don't really know whether to vote for it or not. But I have a question. If it goes through, will it become mandatory that we have to get solar panels? Or will we still have a choice? Because I know people that have gotten those solar panels, they said they did not see a big difference in between what the solar panels cost and the reduction in their uh, electric bills right. even invest in it so sure so I will let the candidates answer that if they feel comfortable um, sure. with the knowledge their knowledge of 127 just for your information though there will be later in the day uh, a more detailed um, conversation about 127 and what it really means so make sure you stick around for that but I'll go ahead and let the candidates answer and I think we started who did we start with last time? Yes. She looks like she wants to answer. <laughs> well, I mean, the bottom line here is no, it won't force you to get solar panels uh, individually. Uh, what it will do is the entire energy composition will have to be 50% renewable for across the state energy. So, and that. That could be you. If you want to put solar panels on, you would just be helping it. But it will be up to the utility companies to make sure that that happens, not up to you as an individual. So you can't be forced uh, to, to do it. That's a that's the technical answer. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Did to my knowledge, I, I agree with that, that you will not be required to purchase solar panels. However, you will be required to pay higher utility rates by about $1,000 a year. Because that will well, that will be what will happen. No, that's not true. If you if you if it is true, if the entire cost of going renewable were passed on to the consumers, if every penny that it costs were passed on to the consumers, that's why it is so important that we change the corporation commission. Because if you elect the right people on the corporation commission, who are supposed to be regulating those companies, APS will no longer be making $400 million a year in profit. And I the- I just wanted to know, is this because they're trying to uh, believe, they believe in, you believe in that um, climate change thing? That uh, hoax made up climate change well, thing? Well, first of all, I do believe in climate change. I but, don't. But, well, okay, but whether you believe it is man-made or not, uh, recently the earth has been getting warmer. It may, some people don't believe in climate change and they believe it'll change. It'll go back and get cooler again. But, but all of that aside, whether, uh, whether people caused it or not, it has been getting warmer. And so we're the only ones around who can figure out how to change it back. And we need to figure out how to change it back before we suffer such consequences waiting around for it to change back on its own if that's what you believe, uh, we need uh, to we can't change, change it back. God can change it back because it has nothing to do thank, with people. Th and thank you. I th that was our last question, though, but I do appreciate your participation. Okay. Yes, and again, at 1.30, we can discuss more about this in relation to Prop 127. I never did get to answer his thing about trees. Do I get to answer that? No? I, what is our time frame? <laughs> So we have to 11.15? Oh, okay, great. Well then, f can I first, you didn't get to answer the question about the tax loopholes? I'll be happy to talk about the so-called tax loopholes. What people need to realize when it comes to taxes, when, we, when the government taxes somebody, they're taking money that was theirs originally. Okay, so it, it, the whole precept or concept that 
the, what is being referred to as a tax loophole is a fallacy. It's tax policy. The policy was put in place by the legislature, you know, so it's, it's policy. It's not a loophole. And the, the whole concept of we're doing stuff so big business can make a more profit and so on and so forth. There's a simple concept here. If you want your economy to grow, there's certain things that you tax less. Okay, so this concept that keeps being thrown out that these these tax loopholes, if you guys want jobs in Arizona, if you want the economy to grow in Arizona, we need to have corporations want to do business in Arizona. And the 300 corpora corporations that have moved to or expand to expanded in the state of Arizona over the past four years have moved here or expanded here for a reason. Because our business friendly environment, the regulations have been, been reduced, these kinds of things are why corporations want to be here. If they, if you don't want them here and you want, you know, less jobs in Arizona, that would be the thing to do. I'm not a proponent of going back and looking at things to hinder the growth of the economy in the state of Arizona. I'm about promoting the growth of the state of Arizona and wanting more corporations to move here and more jobs to move here so we have more people employed so more people can pay their mortgage bill and their electric bill and their car payment and things of that nature and just the simple fact of being able to have a job so they can take care of these things and have self-worth is a huge thing for an individual so this, this tax loophole thing is, is just it's a fallacy Okay, uh, first of all, it isn't just tax policy. Uh, tax policy is very, very important. Actually, it is probably 50% to 75% of the state legislature's job, all right, is to figure out um, how we collect money and how we pay it back out. Uh, that's all important, and we do that. People pay taxes because they want to live in a civil society and they want things to work and they don't want to have to pay for each one of those individually. They want to be able to pay for them collectively. Like, like for instance, widening 347 going north. Wouldn't that be nice? You don't want to have to take up a collection to do that. You want the government to just do it because you're already paying the taxes to do it and it should have been done a long time ago. Uh, not just that, but fixing a lot of other roads. So, but that's not the problem. The problem is that we have been accumulating these since 1990 and we haven't cut them back. We just keep adding on to the pile. It is hard for me to believe that there are tax policy loopholes that we awarded in 1991 and 92 and 93, et cetera, that are still paying us a return on our investment. And we've got to go back and figure out which ones were just throwing money down a hole, and which ones are actually giving us a return on our investment. If they're giving us a return on our investment, great. I love it. That's exactly what government is for, to incentivize the right behaviors, and that includes tax policy. But when 74%, 74% of the corporations in Arizona pay $50 in income tax or less, did you hear 74% of the corporations in Arizona pay $50 or less? I want that kind of tax policy myself. That would be great. Those, some of those companies are happy to pay for more. They really are. I've talked to a lot of these. I belong to five chambers of commerce. I've talked to some big business people. They are happy to pay more taxes if they don't have to worry about the education system, if they don't have to worry about the transportation system and the infrastructure. They say they'd be happy to. Thank you. We have four minutes, and you each get one minute to close. I think you wanted to make one more comment. I'll give you a minute to answer, and then I'll give you a final minute on, okay. um, what was it, wildfires? Wild. Thinning, Trees. I think it was. Okay. Okay, so when it comes to the corporations that are paying $50 a year, uh, I think a logical question to follow that up would be, how many jobs are those corporations bringing to the state of Arizona? How much employment? How much... Are, uh, what benefit is coming from those corporations being here because they have that tax policy in place? That would be a logical question to ask. And then you have to ask yourself, if you want to increase taxes on that corporation, are you putting that corporation in fear of leaving the state of Arizona? 
like the other corporations that have moved here came here? That's a, I think that's a logical question that needs to be asked because the companies that are moving here are moving here because we have the environment that they are looking for, that they can make a profit. So that's something that you have to ask yourself. And I don't want to risk taking jobs away from Arizonans. Great. Thank you. And then one minute on thinning, I think was what you uh, right, asked for earlier. Right. Yes. Uh, believe it or not, it sounds really simple when you talk about thinning the forests and therefore cutting back on the risk of wildfires. That, that sounds really simple. There is actually a lot of controversy surrounding that. And the reason is this. Uh, you know, if all we wanted to do is cut down wild, on wildfires, we could just mow down all the trees, right? Uh, but when you lose the, the over the cover that those trees provide, now all of a sudden there's a lot more evaporation, there's a lot more heat, there's a lot more that goes on, and actually the risk of wildfires can go up, depending, and not necessarily down. And so uh, I'm not saying we shouldn't clear out some underbrush. I'm not saying that at all. But there is a lot of controversy around thinning. It is not as simple and straightforward, like a lot of things in life. It's, uh, there's a lot of gray in this, uh, and a lot of science has to go behind it. And I don't think Arizona should have to pay for that. Let's let the feds keep paying for it. Thank you. So we'll let each of you have 60 seconds as a wrap up, and we'll start with you, Mr. Roberts. OK. Um, well, one of the things that, I want, that we didn't get a chance to talk about here is the, one of the, the, the most important things that you're probably going to see as far as in Arizona in the next session. And at first and foremost, you know, we have um, we've taken care of the teachers at this point. The Arizona Tax Research Association has said that we are going to go from the 40th in the nation as far as teacher pay to 16th once the 20 for 20 plan is in place. And so I think what we need to do at this point is we've, we've, that's a huge jump in, in education as far as teacher pay is concerned. We need to start as legislators worrying about some other fields in the state of Arizona like um, first responders. Our state troopers are currently at 25% behind the curve compared to all of the other law enforcement agencies in the state of Arizona. That and the, the corrections officers themselves have went for many years without pay as well. And these guys, state troopers, they answer the call. You may not be aware of this, but we don't have 24-7 coverage in the state of Arizona, and we need to work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for being here today. Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, in one respect, I do agree with Mr. Roberts uh, that we still have a lot of problems to solve. And uh, let me tell you, the Republicans have run the legislature since 1993, with the exception of two years when there was uh, an, an equality. And it was very interesting because all the committees had to be split, et cetera. So if there are problems that this legislature could have solved, why haven't they been trying to solve them? Uh, the other thing I want to say is when I talk about return and investment, that's exactly what I'm talking about is the benefits that a company can give us. If they're making it, if they're employing people that are returning to the, that are the economy, if they are providing jobs, if they are providing a service that's necessary, they ought to stay. Those folks keep the loopholes for a while. Uh, so all that's important. But what it really comes down to is I think you've paid enough taxes and we need to put your money to work for the schools and the roads and the things you think that you have been funding all these years and they haven't been fixed. I don't care about 20 for 20, 20 by 20, unless it actually happens and we're not at 2020 yet. So elect me and I'll help you get there. Well, I want to thank you both for being here today. And like I said, the election is just around the corner. Don't forget, uh, early ballots come out. Yes, yeah, that's the great news. Signs come down in 31 days. Isn't that the truth? Thanks again for being here.